If you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab it and turn to Daniel chapter 5. And uh, while you're turning there, let me just ask you a question. Um, Have you ever heard the phrase, the writing is on the wall before? Yes. Uh, man, uh, if, you have, if you're not from this half of the room and you haven't heard it, uh, this phrase usually means um, something bad is about to happen. Something is about to come to an end. Something is not going to work out. Um, for example, later this afternoon, you might be saying the writing is on the wall for the eagles. Now, that's not a word of prophecy, um, but I'm just telling you, I hope it happens by the first quarter. We're all saying this game is over. Writing is on the wall. Um, And and that phrase, um, it doesn't originate with sports, though I hope it's very applicable today. Uh, That phrase comes from Daniel chapter 5, where uh, the year is 539 B.C., Um, And so if you've been with us in this series, what that means is God's people have been in exile for nearly 70 years in Babylon. Nearly 70 years has passed since Daniel chapter 1 when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed God's temple, and carried God's people in chains away to the city of Babylon. And um, that means that our boy Daniel, he's probably in his 80s by now. So some of you are like, finally a message I can relate to today. Daniel is in his 80s, and we say it all the time, if you're not dead yet, you're not done yet, and man, is this week, and especially next week, proof, testimony to that. So Daniel's in his 80s. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, um, the king in Babylon the last four chapters, he's dead now, Uh, and he's been dead for about 23 years by the time that this chapter begins. So a big time jump between Daniel 4 and Daniel chapter 5, and um, Nebuchadnezzar's gone, Daniel's still there, but Nebuchadnezzar's spoiled trust fund grandson is now sitting on the throne in Babylon. And um, under his rule, Babylon begins to deteriorate. Um, Now, the people don't realize this. Uh, We're going to see in our text today, they're going to throw a great party because they think everything is going great until a hand shows up in the middle of the party and writes three words on the wall in the royal palace. Uh, This is the story of Daniel chapter 5 that we'll be looking at today, and I'm telling you, this story could not be more relevant for our lives 2,500 years later today. Let's dive in and take a look at what I mean by that. Daniel chapter 5, we'll pick it up in verse 1. We read this. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and he drank wine in front of the thousand. Um, Now, I want to stop just right there and point out a couple of things. Um, Number one, this chapter used to be one of the places that critics of the Bible would point to um, is really a reason to mock the Bible. Um, Because for the longest time, we had no historical record of a king named Belshazzar in Babylon. And so what critics of the Bible would do is they point to Daniel chapter 5 and go, oh, look at the Bible. You can't trust this thing. It's full of inaccuracies and inconsistencies. Have you ever heard someone say this? They said that about Daniel chapter 5 until a series of archaeological finds began to change the scholarly discussion. Um, Really, it all came to a climax in 1924 when tablets were discovered that in the last days of Babylon, Nabonius, who everyone thought and for a long time taught was the last king of Babylon. What these tablets revealed is Nabonius, in the last days of Babylon, left the city in a desperate attempt to push back the invading armies of two nations, um, Persia and Medea. And when he goes out to push back those invading armies, what he did, these tablets said, is he made his son king in his place. Can anyone guess his son's name? Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Try saying that seven times fast. (laughs) And, And here's what I love. Overnight, the scholarly consensus had to change to line up with what the Bible's always said. Um, I I find that fascinating and encouraging um, that for all the scoffers and mockers, give archaeology and science and history enough time. It'll catch up with the word. Um, So I point that out for that reason. But more than that, I want you to understand the historical context behind what's going on in Babylon Babylon in Daniel chapter 5. Because like I said, Babylon at this moment, we know from history outside of the Bible, Babylon is under attack. 
Um, and, and really, two nations, uh, Medo-Persia is what they kind of call the unified coalition they made. They decided, we are sick of Babylon defeating people, pulling people away into exile, causing such havoc in the world. And so these two nations, they banded their forces together to really push back against the armies of Babylon. They felt like enough is enough. We've got to team up and maybe together we can take these guys out. And so they team up forces and they start doing the unthinkable. They start pushing back the Babylonian armies to where in 539 BC, this coalition is just outside of the great city of Babylon. And it's in that moment that Nabonius goes, this does not look good for us. I got to get out of here. I got to go do what I can to fight this back. And he makes his son the king. And what does his son Belshazzar do when dad is out of town? He throws a giant rager. This is every movie from the 90s, by the way. Dad's out of town, and so the spoiled little kid throws a big party with all the keggers for all of his boys. A thousand guys, wine is flowing. All you need is Polly Shore, and this is like straight from the 90s. Um, so, so the question is, is this a good idea? If you haven't seen those movies, let's just keep reading to find out. Verse 2. So Belshazzar, when he had tasted the wine, meaning he's drunk, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Yes, you heard that right. Wives and concubines. Um, as a dad of three girls, I read this story and I'm like, somebody needs to die. Um, in the ancient world, usually kings would build their concubines like separate homes. And I, I'm not defending the practice, but at least they had the wisdom to keep the wives and concubines separate. But here in the last days of Babylon, this guy, he throws a giant party. He gets drunk with all of his friends. And then they bring in these concubines, women who were taught their whole lives that your life has no value out of, outside of pleasing a man. Like, what do you think is happening to those women in this party? Has that ever ended in women being honored and built up and lifted up? Belshazzar gets drunk with a bunch of his boys. He brings in the concubines. And then for some crazy reason, he brings in the wives. Two groups that for sure should be separated. Some of you are like, this, somebody does need to die. Are you kidding me? And it's, it's not all. Verse 4. Excuse me, verse 3. Then they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. The king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, they drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. So in other words, all of this like crazy rager party, it's being done is an act of worship to the demon gods of Babylon. Um, now, um, some of you are like, I'm more disturbed by the wives and concubines than the demon worship. And what I would just say is what we see in the Bible is when your worship is wrong, you start treating other people wrong. That one always leads to the other, but one is the root problem. And here we get to it. You've got this party where they're worshiping demons. Now, um, I would say this, Babylon, if you've been here in the series, you know Babylon has always been an idolatrous place. It's not like in Daniel 4, everything was happy, and then in Daniel chapter 5, you're like, why are they worshiping like that? N no, Babylon's always been an idolatrous place. But at least in Nebuchadnezzar's day, Nebuchadnezzar was a, a great warrior and king who knew when he had responsibilities to protect people and to get out there, and for all his issues, at least he protected the people of Babylon. But to see the way this place is deteriorated, to on the night that uh, Belshazzar should have been making fortifications on the wall and preparing his people for what is to come, on that very night to see that this place, the idolatry has deteriorated to the point where you get this X-rated rager, where they're just losing their minds, says a lot about the deterioration of Babylon between chapters 4 and chapter 5. Um, now, let me just ask this as a question. Do we have any room to judge these guys? Anybody see the Grammys last week? Heard about it. 
You probably heard enough. You're seeing it in Daniel here. here here's the summary. You have some overgrown man child who thinks he's a god, worsh- literally worshiping the devil and uh, using and abusing women in the pro. I mean, nothing has changed in 2,500 years. It's like they pulled the script straight from Daniel chapter 5. And I'm like, did you not realize that was the bad idea in Daniel chapter 5? Did you think this was a good idea to worship Satan and to treat God's daughters cheaply and to lift yourself up? I, okay, I'm not going to keep going on that. All that to say, we don't have any room to judge these guys. And, and see, when you are living in a culture that's devolving like this, into this level of debauchery, it's easy, it's easy to think that this kind of downward spiral will go on forever. And so maybe some of you freaked out this week after seeing the Grammys. Like, what in the world? I was talking to a friend who's not even a Christian. They were just like, what are our kids going to be dancing to at prom? And I'm like, my kids dang sure aren't going to prom if that's the song they're playing. They had some older kids like, oh, it's complicated than that. I'm like, no, it's really not more complicated than that. We don't dance to songs about adultery and worship Satan. Okay, I'm not going to keep going on about that. It's easy to think the downward spiral can go on forever. And maybe you freaked out this week going, is this what our world has become? And and I think I would have freaked out more too if I wasn't studying Daniel chapter 5. But what we see in Daniel chapter 5 is this downward spiral, it doesn't go on forever because God won't let it. Verse 5. Immediately. The fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. Now, I will just tell you, that is the English Standard Version, the translation we use here, being delicate. What it says in the original language is literally his bowels were loosened. He pooped his pants. Can I just put it that blunt to you? He freaked out. And so would you too. If I'm here talking and all of a sudden a hand starts writing on the wall, you would be freaked out too. This is like the only thing he does that makes any sense in the story. He freaks out. And so what does he do? Verse 7. Then the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, you, you know, that whole group. And the king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords, they were all perplexed. Verse 10. Then the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, she came in to the banquet hall. She's the one person in Babylon that has any sense left. She wasn't at this party. But when she hears the freak out, she comes in and she declares, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve problems was found in Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now, let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Um, You literally can't make this stuff up. Belshazzar freaks out, and so he did what Nebuchadnezzar did. He calls in all of his boys, and nobody can solve the problem for him. Uh, We'll find out later. These are just normal Aramaic words. It's, It's three words, one word repeated twice, but no one can quite figure out how those words mean something. And so literally, Belshazzar's mommy has to come to the rescue. This is in the Bible. This is where I'm like, God is so good at trash talk. Like this spoiled kid who did nothing to earn the throne, just got it handed to him, got drunk with a bunch of his friends, treated girls cheaply, worshiped demons. And then in all of his wisdom, he couldn't fix it. So his mommy had to come to the rescue. And and, and I, I think this is cool. Um, 
there's a lot of speculation about King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, like, did he get saved after the events we saw last week? And, and, you know, people will really weigh the evidence. On the one hand, it's like, wow, he sure said all the right things. On the other hand, he kind of said the right things before and then went back to being a tyrannical, murdering dictator right after in the very next chapter. And so there's a lot of speculation, like what happened to him before he died? How did it end for him? And, and I'm not here to solve that. What I will just point out is it's interesting to see his daughter in the text here. That's the queen mother here in our text that comes in to calm her boy. What's so interesting about the queen mother, maybe I just want to honor her for a moment, is to say that number one, she had enough sense to not be at this party. And number two, she's the first Babylonian in the whole book to call Daniel by his Hebrew name. She doesn't call him Belshazzar. She calls him Daniel. And, and when her little boy's life is in the balances and he's freaking out, her first instinct is, honey, let's call Daniel. Daniel knows what to do. The spirit of the holy gods is in him. Maybe her theology still needs a little bit of work, but she can see that there's something in Daniel. And I, I just, I wonder where she got that instinct from. That's all I'm saying. I wonder where she got that instinct from. I think that's cool. I think this woman is incredible. I wish the narrative would zoom in more on her. But that's all we get of her. So now you're like, well, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? And what about his daughter? I don't know, but signs are looking good for this lady and for her uh, daddy. And if God can redeem him, wow. Um, but she comes in and, and, and she sets her boy straight. She's like, honey, let's call Daniel. And at least for all that I have been ragging on this king, at least he has enough sense to listen to his mama. And so he calls in Daniel, just like mommy said, and in verse 13, this is where we can begin to make sense of what's going on. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. This guy's like the person that learns something and then he turns around and acts like he's known it for a long time. Like, Daniel, I've heard of you. It's like, dude, your mom just told you that. But anyway, I, I've heard that you have all of this in you. So verse 15, now, the wise men, the enchanters, they have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known its interpretation, but they couldn't show me the interpretation. But I've heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make it known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said to the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation." I love this. Daniel's like, I'm in my 80s. What am I going to do with Jay-Z's wardrobe? <laughs> I'm not in this for the money. I'm in this because I love God and I want to be a light here. And so I'll tell it to you, but keep the gifts for yourself. I'm just going to serve you. I'm here to be a light. So, and, and this is where we really get to hear what's going on. Verse 18. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness he gave him, all people's nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling with that of the wild donkeys. He was fried grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets it over whom he will. If you are saying, what in the world is all that about? You've got to go back and watch the message that Pastor Phil brought from Daniel chapter 4 last week. That's what's going on here. It's a great word. It's worth discussing. I'm just going to say, say a lot to everything Pastor Phil said last week and keep moving. So he summarizes chapter 4. Then in verse 22, he says this, and you, his son, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. 
but you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you've praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and wood and stone, which do not see and do not hear or know. But the God in whose hands is your very breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and the writing was inscribed. Verse 25. And this is the writing as it was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple and a chain of gold was put around his neck and proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So this is what the whole writing on the wall is about. It is a word of judgment. Daniel says God has seen the evil of Babylon and he has decided it is time to put it to an end. And in God's poetic justice, he's going to do it by allowing the evil that you have been committing on the world to come back on your own head. He's going to allow two nations that you've been oppressing to come in and ransack you and destroy your city just like you've destroyed so many others. And that very night, the word is carried out. And what's interesting is historians outside of the Bible will tell us this is exactly how it happened. That on the night Babylon fell, there was a huge party going on in the city. And so the coalition armies, they walked into the city unchallenged. They got in there, he's drunk, they kill him, it's really easy. And, and so that's what the story is about. It's a story of judgment and wrath and consequences. All of it orchestrated by the hand of God. Just like we saw in his own people in chapter 1. God is now rising up in judgment using human nations to carry out his judgment. Only this time it's on Babylon. Um, This is one of those stories in the Bible that we, we tend to want to skip past, right? I mean, there's a reason we teach Daniel 3 to the children. We teach Daniel 6 to the children. I never heard this story growing up in church. This is one of the stories that we tend to like to skip past because we're a lot more comfortable with stories of God's love than his judgment. And so look, maybe some of you are thinking, I cannot believe I invited my friend to church on Judgment Sunday. (laughs) And, and, And look, I mean... If your friend's here, if you're the friend, if you're here, you're here anyway. Let's just talk about it, all right? Um, Let me say this. I believe that this text isn't something to be skipped over, but that this text is full of good news for you and me. It's full of good news. Let me step away from Daniel chapter 5 that's tense and intense, and we're like, oh my goodness, can God really do that? Let's just step away from Daniel 5 for a moment, and let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, A couple weeks ago, I finally watched the Will Smith movie, Emancipation. Has anybody seen this movie? Really? I thought this was going to be a much better sermon illustration. (laughs) Um, Hey, it's a great movie. If you have Apple TV, this is worth seeing. Now, I will say this. It is a heavy movie. So if you've got enough drama in your life, maybe this is not the film for you right now. But I think it's an important film because it is based on the true story of a man named Peter who was a runaway slave during the Civil War. That's who Will Smith plays, Peter. And um, the movie kind of goes like you're imagining it would. Uh, He is separated from his family forcibly, tearfully, painfully. Uh, He is beat and treated shamefully and forced to do terrible, terrible things. And, and when, when the moment comes for him to get away from all this and he finally gets on the run, uh, they begin to hunt him down like an animal. 
Um, literally, like I don't like saying that, but this is what happens in the movie. The guy that's hunting down Will Smith literally treats it like a sport. He calls this human a dog, and he acts like he's hunting down an animal. And, and Peter, he goes through hell trying to get away from this guy. Uh, this is the movie. It's him running. And, okay, do I go on the road where he's going to get me or into the water where there's alligators or crocodiles? I can never tell the difference, but they bite. And he goes through hell trying to get away from this guy. And it, it is a brutal story, and I'm, so, I'm just going to spoil it for you. Um, because apparently none of you are interested in seeing it anyway, so I'll just spoil it for you, all right? <laughs> At the climax of the movie, when Peter is just yards away from the sound of Union cannons, and he knows that freedom is just on the other side of that plane, I've just got to make it through, and he throws all caution to the wind, and in desperation, he makes a run across the plane for it. And you're like, okay, it's been enough time. This is probably the happy ending. And as he's running, you start to hear the sound of a horse galloping. And all of a sudden, the man that's been chasing him all movie long knocks him to the ground. He pulls out a whip. He starts beating him. And he makes this stupid speech about how Peter is a dog and he is God. I mean, it is awful. It is. And, and I'm at this point, and I'm like, this is a true story. So you're not guaranteed a happy ending. And I'm like, did I just spend two hours of my life on this? And as he's giving the speech, he pulls out a gun and he holds it to Will Smith's head. And right as he's about to pull the trigger, and I'm losing my mind, he pulls out the gun and right before he can pull the trigger, Union soldiers show up and beat him to the punch. And pow, he goes down. And in that moment, I did that. I jumped off, I literally jumped off my couch and went, yes! And so would you if you were watching this movie. <laughs> and that, I would submit to you, is what's going on in this story. God shows up, not after two hours, after 70 long years of Babylon, causing havoc and chaos in the world. Far, like on a scale that would embarrass those that made the movie. And he shows up in Daniel chapter 5 and says, you are are done hurting people. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. It's over. It's judgment day. I am not going to allow this continue. You are done. And, and I know it's heavy when you bring it out of the realm of a film to the Bible. But what I will tell you this is, I guarantee you, if you lived under the boot of Babylon, if you lived in this day, you wouldn't want to skip over this text. You would want to celebrate it. You would write songs about it. And I know that because people did write songs about this day. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk, you remember a couple of years ago now, we went through the book of Habakkuk. He wrote a song about this day, about the fall of Babylon the Great, celebrating it. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, he wrote a song about this day too, celebrating that the mighty, mighty Babylon has fallen. Um, the, the psalmist, the, the songbook in the center of the Bible has a whole psalm saying, happy is the one that brings you down, Babylon. This is something that several, several people celebrated this day because for them, Babylon wasn't an idea of an empire that lived long ago. It was a reality of a people that had oppressed their lives, that had burned their cities, that had killed their brothers, that had taken their wives and daughters and made them into concubines, and taken their sons and made them into eunuchs, and tried to brainwash them with new names and a new religion. And when you didn't bow to that new religion and new morality, they'd throw you into a fiery furnace. See, some of us, we live such lives of privilege where we've never truly suffered like this. And so we come to passages about God's judgment and we philosophize and go, I don't know if I could believe in a God who would do that. If you've suffered, you could, you would, and you'd celebrate it. That, that's what's going on in this text here. We, we have such an arrogance when we say, I can't believe in a God who would rise up and put down nations to his own pleasure. I can't believe in a God who would judge sin and say, that is wrong and this is right. Like, the, 
the disconnect with reality that we have from humans throughout history to say things like that shows what privileged, sheltered lives we live. And I think we need to, for a moment, just sit back and shut up and listen to people that have really lived throughout history. Because I get that this doctrine is controversial in 2023. It wasn't in 539 B.C. Because they really lived. And they suffered. And look, I'm not saying some of you, I know some of you have suffered, and I know you're not the one I'm talking to right now. Because you know what it's like to be under the boot of another. You know what it's like to say, does anybody care? Does anybody notice? Is, is there any future and any hope? And what this passage is proclaiming is God sees and he cares enough to get involved and to give you a future and a hope by putting an end to the evil and those who would commit that against you. That's, that's what this chapter is about. And I think when you lay that against this popular notion of God being some sky fairy who only feels love and never feels any wrath or anger, like I don't think that the popular character like that version of God can compare with the living God of the Bible, who is full of love and justice. This modern idea of God who's all love and just sprinkles pixie dust and never gets angry at anything, I'm like, that God, to claim that he loves us is such a joke. Because if you love anything, if you love anyone and someone threatens that thing and you sit back indifferent... Like, how much would those Union soldiers have had to hate Will Smith's character to show up and to see what was going on and go, who am I to judge? I don't want to be unpopular with the Americans in 2023. I want to be hip. And so, nope, I, just kill the guy. Do what you got to do. I would submit to you, that God is a moral monster. This God is the only God worth believing in who cares and is bothered enough by the evil in our world to get involved and to rise up and put an end to it. That's what's going on in Daniel chapter 5. And this is why I think deep down we can do with movies. We have a hard time when we talk religion. But this is why we love movies like Taken. When Liam Neeson says, you've taken my daughter, well, guess what? I have a particular set of skills, and this is not going to end well for you. This is why we love movies like Emancipation for all two of you that saw it, because we want someone to care this much about us. For as sophisticated as the sky fairy God sounds, the God that actually cares is the God who will get involved and stand up and say, not my daughter, not my son, not today, you're done. And that's the God of Daniel chapter 5. He is a God who loves us enough to judge sin and to restore a state of goodness in the world. Um, I've got a quote from you from an incredible pastor named Eugene Peterson. Um, this guy, he translated the entire Bible for his granddaughter because he wanted to make it intelligible to her. Wonderful, wonderful man. He's with Jesus now. Uh, the Bible translation is the message. If you've ever read that, that was one guy trying to convey to his daughter what the word, or granddaughter what the word of God says. He, here's how he talks about God's judgment. I think maybe this is helpful. He says this, Judgment is not a word about things, describing them. It is a word that does things, putting love in motion, applying mercy, nullifying wrong, and ordering goodness. That is what I would submit to you God is doing in this story. He's rising up to put his love into motion, to nullify the wrongs of Babylon, and to reorder and reestablish goodness in the world on the other side of the dark shadow of the evil empire of Babylon. And, and I press this point because it's not just Daniel chapter 5. You cannot just skip past this story. The whole story of the Bible is headed towards a day where Jesus comes back and destroys, get this, Babylon. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Babylon had been dead and gone for so many years. But the idea in the Bible is that Babylon is not only a nation from history, but it is a spirit at work in the world. And the whole hope of the Bible is that one day Jesus will return from heaven and do on a global scale what he did in the geopolitical nation of Babylon in 539 BC. That the whole Bible leads up to this moment where Jesus comes down from heaven and destroys Babylon on a global scale. 
and judges sin and removes it from the earth and recreates the earth anew, free of sin, where there is no crying, no pain, because God in his judgment has removed the evil from the world and all that is left is happiness and joy forever in his presence. This is the hope literally of the entire Bible, that God would someday do this on a global scale. That's the hope. The problem is, well, l- let me put it to you this way. There is a problem. So, so, so that's the hope of the whole Bible, that God would rise up to judge evil, to remove it from the world, to reorder goodness. That's the hope. But the very same prophets who sang about this day, as they began to reflect on it, they started to say things like, okay, but we're not actually so different from Babylon. We're not actually so different from Belshazzar. And and what the prophets, again, the guys I just listened to earlier, Isaiah being chief among them would say is, man, if God were to weigh us, God's people, if he were to weigh our lives in the balance, man, who among us wouldn't be found wanting? And, and, and this just occurred to me, but I wonder, maybe this is why we don't like to talk about passages of judgment, is deep down we all know if God weighs my life, he will find it wanting. Because I have contributed to the evil of this world, and you have too. And if you're stiffening your neck and hardening your heart like Belshazzar, let me just, let me just say the whole like, hey, I don't have wives and concubines, I haven't killed anybody, doesn't cut it because God doesn't grade on a curve. Jesus said, if you've ever lusted after someone with your eyes, you've committed adultery. So you do have wives and concubines. Jesus said, if you've ever been angry unreasonably with someone in your heart, you've murdered them. So congratulations, you're a murderer. And some of us, we're mass murderers. We're serial killers. God takes the goodness of his world so seriously that he doesn't grade on a curve like we do and say, well, at least she's better than her friends because they're crazy. She's just kind of so-so. I could work with that. God cares so much about the goodness of the world that he doesn't let idolatrous, lying murders walk around hurting people. Um, The way the prophet Isaiah says it, Isaiah will celebrate this day, and then at the end of his book, he says this, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, so catch this, even on days that we're doing good stuff, they are nothing but filthy rags. Because isn't this true of your life? Sometimes you do the right thing with the wrong motive, and God's like, that's wicked, that's evil. Like autumn leaves, we wither and we fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. And it's not just the prophets that know this. God knows this. This is why Daniel chapter 5 is not the last chapter we have in the Bible. This is why as the prophets begin to reflect on these things and go, hey, that's good news. Oh, no, wait. The prophets will go on to tell about a day. God told me he's going to send someone to make this good news for us. And, And look, if you're new to church, I've been getting questions lately like, how are we in the Old Testament? How is it about Jesus every week? And one of my... One of my desires as your pastor is just to show you what Jesus said the whole book is about him. And so I just want to take for a moment to show you how this whole story is leading to Jesus. And and see if this makes sense for you. See if this connects. God is a God of justice. So he won't tolerate evil in the world. He's also a God of love and he loves us and he doesn't want us to be destroyed. And yet if we're all honest, we are broken by sin. We're going to fall on the wrong side of the celebration of the judgment day. Creation's going to cry out and be happy that the evil is removed, but we're not going to be happy on that day. And so what does God do? In the fullness of time, God himself sends his son Jesus. And this, look, check this out. This is not the last time in scripture the hand of God is mentioned. Jesus says in Luke's gospel, I believe it's chapter 11, he says, if by the finger of God I cast out demons among you, then truly the power of God has showed up among you. He's talking to a group of scoffers who are like, you're not the real deal, you're not from God, and Jesus claims to be the very finger of God at work in the world. And so he comes to show them, hey, God's standards aren't on a curve, they go down to the heart. He comes, but... 
you got to hear it from Jesus. He did not come to condemn us. John 3, 17 says the world was condemned already. Jesus didn't have to do anything to condemn us. We did plenty to condemn us. Jesus came into the world to save us. And so at the end, he, he lives the only perfect life in human history. What all four Gospels record is that at his baptism, the voice of God from heaven gives an assessment of his life. Jesus' life is weighed, and what the Father says is, you are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. The first human ever to be found, weighed in the balances, and found pleasing. And what does he do? He goes to a cross, and on that cross, Jesus steps in the place of sinners, a place that he did not belong by God's own assessment of his son. He steps on the cross. He steps in our place. If the wrath of God is a freight train coming for us, Jesus steps in our place and knocks us out of the way. And on the cross, he trades his perfect record to sinners like you and me for anyone who would believe. And he says, I'm going to take on your sin, and I will deal with your sin, and I'm going to give you my righteousness so that the justice and love of God could meet in the cross of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, the good news of this chapter could become good news for anyone who believes that Jesus can take on our sins. And he's big enough and strong enough to remove them from us so that when our lives are weighed at the end of history. In spite of our struggle, in spite of the junk in our lives, our, wives, our lives could be weighed and found God's beloved sons and daughters because of his work for us. Jesus was weighed in the balances and found wanting so that you and I could be weighed in the balances and found pleasing and perfect in his sight and citizens in the new kingdom and new world he is building, building free of the madness of what we've done to this one. And so what does all that then have to do with shining in Babylon? Because we said that's what the series is about, is we're here to shine in Babylon. Um, I, I would submit to you two things as we wrap this up. Um, number one, if you believe that your sin, not just the past sin, but your present struggle and your future sin, it's been paid for, then all of a sudden this chapter is good news for you. No matter how you struggled this week, if you believe Jesus literally was weighed in the balances for you, then there's nothing for God to have wrath left for in your life. That sin has been dealt with. And so if you believe that, you can embrace this chapter as the good news that it is. You can embrace there is a day coming where God is going to judge and remove sin from this world entirely. And by his everlasting grace, I'm not going to be a part of what's removed. Only the old me, the new me, the true me, I get to live forever. If you really believe that, then I think it makes you a little more unshakable when you live in the midst of the darkness of a devolving culture like Babylon. I mean, if you believe there's a God of love and justice, I think it changes how you respond when Babylon throws your friends in the furnace and when these parties happen. And look, I'm not saying it means that we don't care about justice. What scripture tells us elsewhere is that as God's people, we are to reflect his justice in the world insofar as it depends upon us. This is why we are adopting a week as love life, because we think the injustice of our world is unacceptable, and we think God is too good and too loving to let this go on. So it doesn't mean that we don't care about evil and justice. By all means, let's continue to get in the game, church. But what it does mean is we are not consumed by it. See, we live in a day that loves the idea of justice, just not from God, but we live in a day that's talking all about social justice and all of these things. And, and as God's people, we should care about that, but there is a way in which I am seeing our world is consumed by the idea of justice consumed by in such a way that you have one group of people saying, this has been unjust to me, so I'm going to be unjust to you, and somehow that's going to balance it out. And we're consumed with darkness and hopelessness, and it is really not much of an improvement over the injustice of the past. But if you believe that there is a God of perfect justice, you don't have to be consumed and cranky and constantly complaining and griping and being a bad news person. If you believe there's a God of perfect justice who will one day make the world right, 
it frees you to pursue that justice now, but where you see it thwarted in the world, it doesn't mean that you shut your mouth, but it does mean that you don't let it consume you and make you a twisted, cranky, awful person to be around. I see so much of this both in the church and outside of the church that we can get so consumed by the darkness of the world that it's like, is there any good news that you have in there? And what this chapter is meant to do is it's meant to remind us that this day is coming. And so as we fight for justice, we don't have to become nasty, bitter, evil people that fight fire with fire. We can get our eyes up onto the God of perfect justice and ask him to move in our day and trust that he will do it. And so we don't have to lose our minds over this stuff. And I think this is how Daniel and his friends survived Babylon. Because we'll see it next week, Medo-Persia is a little better than Babylon, but they're not a huge improvement. And the nations that come after them, and on and on it goes. And so Daniel writes this book for God's people to know, hey, when you're living in the dark, light is coming. And as you get your eyes up onto the day of judgment that is coming, and the good news that that is now for you in Christ, you can be a good news person shining in the midst of the darkness. It doesn't mean you pretend there's no darkness, but you can be a good news person there. And so that's the first thing. I think it allows us to fight for justice without being consumed by it. Um, But I I also want to submit to you maybe a more personal application of all of this. And so, yes, God is going to judge the world, and that's what enables us to not lose hope in the midst of a dark culture. And so if that's your takeaway today, take it home. Be encouraged by it. Do not lose heart. He's coming again. He's going to make the world right. In addition to that, I also want to suggest this. God never judges without first giving warnings. Never. Never. Um, That's what Daniel told Belshazzar. He said, God gave you so many chances to repent, and you didn't listen to any of it. And on this day, on the day that God finally brought his judgment to Babylon, he, in his grace, sent a hand to write on the wall. Like, could he have done anything more to get a hold of this guy's attention? He sent a hand to write onto the wall to say, there's no future in this way of life for you. Repent. Repent. And what does Belshazzar do? He ignores it and he goes back to the party and he dies that very night. And I just wonder if there's some of us in here that maybe the writing is on the wall in our life. And, and, and look, maybe, maybe it's not a salvation issue for you. Maybe you're a Christian and you're covered in the blood of Jesus, but God is revealing something to you in your life. And Jesus has been pointing his finger at it. He's been telling you there is no future in this thing here. You need to deal with this thing here. God has been getting your attention. And and maybe you were like Belshazzar this morning where you are just ready for the sermon to be over so you can get out of here and go back to the party. And what I want to plead with you is to actually respond to what God is saying this morning. We end our messages each week saying this, to let's take some time to respond to God's word because the book of Hebrews says it this way, if you harden his heart when he speaks to you, that is a dangerous place to be. We don't want to harden our heart to God's voice. We want to respond to it. And so look, maybe some of you, the writing is on the wall. Jesus has been speaking to you for some time. And maybe today's the day that you need to respond and deal with that. Um, I I would just encourage you with this from my experience. God loves you no matter how hard that thing is written on the wall. And he would not bring it up to you if he didn't have more life for you in that place. And so as we turn to begin our week-long response to this message, I just want to encourage you. Do not harden your heart to his voice. If the writing is on the wall in your life, it could be something not even related to this message. But I think the Holy Spirit's going to show you what that is. If God is speaking to you, let's not harden our hearts and go back to the party. Let us respond to his voice. Because that writing doesn't come from a hand pointing at you, being against you. That writing comes from a hand that was nailed to a tree open for you shedding its blood for you his blood for you because he is for you and it might not feel like kindness that he's pointing his finger at that but I can promise you this from my own experience if he's pointing to it he's not pointing like this he's pointing like this so I want to invite us let's come to him this morning and experience the good news of this text 
Let me pray for us, and then we'll take some time to do that. Jesus, thank you for loving us so much that you didn't just want to remove our sin from the world, but that you loved us so much and wanted to give us a future and a hope that you came into the world and you took on the punishment we deserve. You took on the judgment and the wrath due to us. God, we're never gonna fully understand that, but I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit this morning to capture our hearts and minds with the depth of your love for us. That you see what's been done to us, you see what we've been done to others. And you are full of love for us. You are full of grace and mercy and truth. And so I pray that you would just help us to respond to you. Don't let us harden our hearts like Belshazzar. God, how many times have we done that? Would you give us the gift of a soft heart this morning that can hear your voice, to see what you are saying to us and come to you? And where maybe some of us are struggling under the boot of injustice, would you help us to have hope that one day you are gonna set things right? And would you make Fair Oaks a church that is an agent for that justice in the world right now? I pray if there's anyone who is struggling in a, uh, in a dangerous situation, that you would give them the faith to come forward and ask for help. I pray that you would give us the grace to be a church that can be safe and to remove people from dangerous situations because we know this is your heart. And we know one day you will do it fully. Help us to trust you in the in-between. In your beautiful name I ask.